The server prevalence survey data from five Prabhaks in Pune have suggested that almost 51.5% of the people have been exposed to the novel coronavirus. I have Karan Kamble joining me to discuss the same, who did a very insightful article on this issue just yesterday. So Karan, this uh, research has been conducted in multiple cities, right? It has been done in Delhi, Ahmedabad, Mumbai. What does a study of this kind aim to achieve in the first place? Uh, right, Tarkesh, um, that's a good question. Uh, essentially, what they're trying to do is to find out the number of people who could have actually been exposed to the virus. Now, uh, you would ask, aren't we getting that from the testing numbers that the government puts out? Now, there's a difference because what we've learned is that if you, you might be exposed to the virus and you might get really sick and then you might go to the hospital and get tested, which is the RT-PCR test. And then that might show positive or negative. If it shows positive, then you're on the rolls, you're on the records as uh, COVID-19 positive. But what happens is that there might be a lot of people who might be infected, who might have been exposed to the virus, uh, but have actually simply ridden it out at home. So what's happened is that they've been exposed, uh, but they weren't sick enough to go to the hospital and get tested. They pretty much recovered on their own. So now we see that there are these two numbers, you know, one is uh, the numbers that come uh, from the government, which is the numbers that come from the RT-PCR tests. And then there is these serological surveys, which basically um, detect antibodies, the IgG antibodies, uh, which were generated on exposure to the virus. So on the basis of that, uh, they can sort of determine if you have been exposed to the virus. Now that number, of course, is much higher uh, than the number of people who are showing up on the records as officially COVID-19 positive. And there are multiple ways that they do that. Now, of course, we know that in, in, the, in the tests that were conducted in, say, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Pune, uh, for instance, they've basically been taking the blood serum and then testing that. Uh, but there are other ways to find out how people could be infected, like the recent study um, where they studied the feces and they put that to the RT-PCR and identified that Hyderabad had over six and a half lakh cases. So there are basically different approaches. Uh, the idea is to find out what you would call asymptomatic carriers. That is people who are not showing symptoms or very mild symptoms, uh, but have the virus and that doesn't show on the records. Also, do the over overwhelming numbers in this case also suggest the development of a neutralizing antibody or are there other factors that one might have to look for that? Right, uh, Turkish, there is a distinction to be made. Um, there might be antibodies, uh, but what we are learning uh, is that antibodies could decay over time and they could decay really rapidly, um, about say two weeks um, or three weeks. So. What's happening is that we need to do further studies and analysis to determine how many of these are neutralizing antibodies, right? Those that can actually prevent the virus from latching onto the host cells inside us and therefore prevent infection. Um, now, the principal investigator for the study, uh, Dr. Arti Nagarkar, actually, I spoke to her and she told me that there would be a study happening in the future where they would be uh, going on a hunt for these neutralizing antibodies. Now, this is very important and I'll give you an example why. Uh, just recently, a paper was published on a study that was done on a fishing boat on Seattle, uh, in Seattle. Um, so what happened is they tested people uh, prior to getting onto the fishing boat and then after they got off the fishing boat and it was about an 18 day voyage, uh, if I'm not wrong. What they found is that there were three people, three crew members who had neutralizing antibodies at the start. Then when these guys got onto the boat, uh, there was a virus outbreak and over 85% of people were infected. But after they came back and they were tested, it was found that these three people who had neutralizing antibodies to begin with remained completely unscathed amid the outbreak going around them. So that's why it's extraordinarily important to know if there are neutralizing antibodies. Now in the same study, there were six people who had antibodies and three had the evidence of having neutralizing antibodies. And the ones who had neutralizing antibodies were able to remain 
completely unscathed from the outbreak around them. So let's see, Pune is going to do that study in the future and we're going to know more about it, uh, hopefully in about a couple of months, maybe. Okay. Karan, also there are clusters in every city, right? Places where you find a high number of cases and there are other places where you find a low number of cases. These five prabhaks in which this particular study was conducted in, which category do they fall in specifically? Uh, Turkish, uh, they basically identified uh, five high incidence uh, sub wards or prabhaks as you're calling them. Um, high incidence would mean that they were registering high cases of the coronavirus of, of COVID-19. Uh, as on the 1st June. So that was sort of the date um, that they picked. And with the help of the PMC, which is the Pune Municipal Corporation, they were able to identify uh, these. Uh, the wards were identified randomly, but the study was looking at high incidence wards. Uh, so that's how they went about randomly picking these five uh, different wards. Okay. Also, what... So also, what makes the numbers go so high in Pune in comparison to, say, a Delhi or a Mumbai? Is it the time period in which this, the months in which this study is being conducted, or the number of people who are being assessed, or are there any other, or are there any other facets that one might have to look at? Uh, right now, that's that's something that I asked a couple of experts because, and there is no definite answer to this. Uh, we can't really pin it down to a certain reason scientifically that this is why the cases are so high. But a couple of reasons could, you know, spring up. One is, of course, the period when the samples were identified or picked to be tested. Now, Delhi was much before. I think it was about May, June. And uh, Mumbai was more June, July. And uh, this was uh, from 20th July to 5th August. So... There is a sort of a progression in the period when the samples are tested, right? Now, as we've moved through the pandemic journey in India, uh, of course, the numbers have risen and exposure has increased. Um, so that could explain to a very small extent why uh, you're seeing such high prevalence in Pune. Now, another thing is, um, of course, again, uh, Dr. Aarti Nagarkar told me that then she conjectured that it could be because, you know, right at the beginning, we had a, a lockdown, which is a tough lockdown where everyone was pretty much at home. And then there was a bit of a release after a point, which is, uh, you know, April, May, June. So these three months, there was some amount of movement in terms of people uh, trying to go back to their homes who were stranded somewhere else and needed to get back home for safety. Uh, there were other cases um, where people, you know, out of compulsion might have wanted to go back to their jobs, for instance. So there could be a combination of these factors that explain the high prevalence. Of course, in terms of uh, social distancing and wearing the masks, um, it's not quite clear as to how much of that uh, impacted this, uh, the degree that is. Okay, and uh, af in the aftermath of the results of the study, uh Questions also arose regarding whether the district is approaching the her the so-called herd immunity in their ongoing battle against the pandemic. When you speak of herd immunity, uh, earlier there used to be a stringent threshold, right? The number of people who need to develop uh, an immune system towards the virus. But is that number becoming more flexible now uh, according to the various uh, factors? Is that number becoming lesser or more as we continue living with the virus? Right. Uh, so early on, we kept hearing the number 60 to 70 percent. So that was what was agreed upon uh, by a lot of experts and then policymakers took from that. Uh, and they thought that, OK, 60 to 70 percent of the population had to have been exposed to the virus in order to then uh, slow down uh, the spread of the virus considerably. But... Um, you know, really interesting studies across the world and um, even the New York Times recently put out a report where um, various experts who are doing uh, statistical modeling of the, of the outbreaks and trying to figure out uh, and computing what uh, possible scenarios, uh, they sort of gave very varying numbers. Uh, some of them put it as low as 10 to 20 percent, right? So that's shocking from 50 to from 60 to 70 percent down to 20 percent. Some others gave a number of 40 percent. 
So more or less in the ballpark, what we can say is that the number might be lower than 60 to 70 percent. That is the number required for herd immunity okay. to kick in, which is you slow down the spread of the virus considerably. All right, Karan, you have explained the global trends quite uh, appropriately here. But what does that mean for Pune? Uh, right, Tarkesh, now we should be very wary of making any conclusions about herd immunity uh, in Pune. Uh, frankly, because of some of the factors that we discussed earlier, they need to look at, you know, neutralizing antibodies. They need to see how long the immunity lasts. Now, for instance, if I'm exposed to the virus, I develop immunity and then I experience a decay in antibodies and then I become vulnerable again. So that means that I have not really, I mean, that doesn't mean much for herd immunity because essentially what happens is that I'm infected and then I recover and then I'm susceptible to be infected again. Now that's not going to help because if I'm going to be infected again, I could again pass on the virus around in my neighborhood. So uh, the key here is to know how much of that is actual, uh, you know, neutralizing antibodies and for how long the immunity lasts. Now, recent trends are positive, optimistic. They peg it at about three to six months. Uh, of course, the Seattle Fishing Boat Study is also quite encouraging. And we've not had any internationally acknowledged uh, cases of reinfection, except, uh, I mean, there have been odd cases, uh, like for instance, in Japan, uh, they reported that there was one person who was reinfected, but we still have no clarity about that. So uh, even the principal investigator behind the Pune survey told me that the message is not that this is herd immunity. It's not. Uh, you have to take all the precautions necessary uh, from the start, right? And even uh, the Ministry of Health has also said that herd immunity is not a strategic option or a direction that they are looking at. Uh, but it's quite interesting. Uh, more light could be shed on this uh, over time as we do more studies and analysis. And also, you know, Tarkesh, just one more point I'd like to say is that uh, we already discussed that it's not a, you know, like a fixed threshold, it's moving. What is encouraging is that antibody levels are rising uh, day after day, right, in people. And that means, assuming that some of them are neutralizing antibodies, that people are collectively becoming immune. So anyway, the virus spread is going to slow down. So I think rather than speak uh, about herd immunity in Pune, which we shouldn't, um, as more and more studies and anal analysis come out, we will learn more about it. But it's quite interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Karan, for coming on this episode of Swaraja Direct Line. Uh, do keep tuning in for more such discussions on developing topics in the coming days. Thank you very much.